Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for your patience while we dealt with some technical difficulties. Uh, thank you for attending Laurier's Milton Lecture Series. The series runs the second Wednesday of the month, October to May at 7 p.m. If this is your first lecture of the series, welcome. If not, welcome back. My name is Maria and I work for the Milton Public Library. We are so proud to be partners with Wilfrid Laurier University on this incredible series. Um, unfortunately, tonight our Laurier partner, Carolyn Hawthorne, was un unable to join us um, and she does send her regards. Uh, just a few housekeeping things. Um, you've been muted on entry with videos turned off and we have uh, carved out some time for questions at the end. If you have them, please use the question answer function on the bottom of the screen. Uh, this lecture is being recorded and will be shared via email in the coming days, as well as available on the Milton Public Library YouTube page. Before we begin the program, we would like to acknowledge that Wilfrid Laurier University and its campuses are located on the Haldeman Tract, traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee peoples. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis and Indigenous peoples from across Turtle Island. We recognize, honor, and respect these nations as the traditional stewards of the lands and water on which Laurier is now present. Perhaps you're joining us from another location. If that's the case, I would encourage you to take a moment to honor the Indigenous people who have lived and worked where you re reside historically and presently. Acknowledging them reminds us of our important connection to this land where we live, learn, and work. I'm excited to introduce tonight's topic, the education and labor market transition of African youth with refugee backgrounds in Canada with Dr. Stacey wilson Forsberg and Dr. Oliver Masakura. Dr. Stacey wilson Forsberg is an associate professor in the Human Rights and Human Diversity Program at Wilfrid Laurier University, director of the Chepo Institute of the Study of Contemporary Africa, and fellow of the Balsili School of International Affairs. She has been undertaking qualitative research with immigrants and refugees since 2008. Dr. Wilson Forsberg is presently leading and co-leading with Dr. Oliver Masakura, several social sciences and humanities research council funded projects focusing on school and labor market transitions of African youth with refugee backgrounds. These community engaged projects involve several universities and community partners across Canada, including Adventure for Change in Waterloo and Empowerment Squared in Hamilton, Ontario. Dr. Oliver Masakura is an associate professor and director of the Business Technology Management Program in the Lazardis School of Business and Economics. He's also the associate director of the Shepo Institute for the Study of Contemporary Africa an applied economist, his research and publishing focus is on areas of the intersection of innovation, education, and labor economics. And I'm just welcoming them on screen right now and uh, unmuting. Welcome. Thank you so much for being here tonight. Thank you. Thank you for having us. I'm just going to minimize my screen and uh, allow you to do your presentation. Okay. Well, thank you everybody for attending tonight. I really wish we could actually see the audience. Um, I'm really looking forward to the day where we can do these things in person. I've done a Laurier Milton lecture before and it's a very, very special event where a lot of the Milton community came out and it was, it was a lot of fun. And uh, we've been doing these video um, presentations and teaching for throughout the pandemic and it's, it's, uh, it's just not the same at all. Um, I apologize as well for some technical difficulties. I'm here with uh, Dr. Oliver Masakure, my partner in crime. Um, for those of you in the audience who know Oliver, he's not a quiet man. However, tonight he's quiet because we could not get his microphone working. Um, so, <laughs> so I'm going to be doing all of the talking um, th th this evening and Oliver is going to kill him. It's absolutely going to kill him that I'm going to be doing all of the talking for us. And he's basically going to give the thumbs up and uh, perhaps at the end somehow we can get him involved in some questions. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and put a presentation on the screen and hope that it actually works for us. We were having a little bit of problems. Um, oops, actually, I've got to share my screen first. Apologize for that. Um, we're so used to using Zoom that we're using a new system and uh, we're like two small children trying to figure this out. 
there we go. Same premise. Okay, can everybody see my screen? Is there anyone who can give me a thumbs up on that? I, I can't, uh, okay, well, I can only see the actual presentation. I can't see anybody else. So hopefully you are all able to see it. And uh, I don't even think I can get a chat box. Okay, well, uh, we're really happy again to be here this evening. Um, the, the topic is the education and labor market transitions of African youth with refugee backgrounds in Canada. And uh, we have, uh, I think our, our, our funders were, were acknowledged, the uh, Social Sciences Humanities Research Council, SHRC, also the Child and Youth Refugee Research Coalition out of Dalhousie University the Shepo Institute for the Study of Contemporary Africa, uh, and then our other our partners, Adventure for Change and Empowerment Squared, which we will go into in quite some detail. Stacy, this is Maria. If you could just put your uh, slideshow um, to project, we only see the, the start. If you can do, do it from the beginning. Do, sorry, sorry. As a presentation, we only see it as, um, as a, a, at the beginning of part of the slideshow. We don't see it on the full screen. Okay, so how do I do that? <laughs> it, um, just in your slideshow, just put from beginning and it'll fill the screen. Oh, there we go. Can you see it now? Are you able to see it? Uh, yes, if, yes. Okay, yes. you're good now? Okay, perfect. All new to us. Okay, so. Uh, the presentation tonight is, is a little bit unique for, for an academic research presentation because we're really not going through a lot of results. Um, we're actually talking about a research program that is constantly growing and evolving. Um, and um, the, the, as, the, as the outline shows, these, these are, are the various pieces. Um, so the outline builds on, um, each piece builds on the other. Um, and each, each piece fills in a gap that was left by the other piece. Um, so we're trying to, pr to provide a big picture understanding of what these young people, so, so uh, youth, youth from various African countries, uh, some arrived as, as babies uh, to Canada and grew up in Canada. We call them the 1.5 generation and some arrived as, as teenagers quite recently uh, from across Canada. And uh, we're looking at their, their big picture, their school experience, um, their transition into, into um, high school from, from elementary school or middle school, their transition into university or college, and then their transition into the labor market as well. And all of the factors, all of the variables that play in there and all of the relationships, um, their, their family, uh, their, their challenges, their pathways, um, obstacles, contexts, institutions, community organizations. Um, and this work requires many, many different partners on the ground. Um, it's it's community-engaged research. It's a very slow process. It involves a, building a lot of trust, building a lot of relationships, um, and it's a lot of fun. Uh, we're, we're enjoying this, this research a lot. Um, the other, uh, the other interesting uh, piece of the research is we don't have one theory. Uh, we're not creating theory. We're not, we don't have a single theory. There's several theories woven through the research, including critical race theory, because of course, racism plays into this, but it's not what we're leading with. Um, so to, to introduce the topic, uh, back in uh, 2015, we were working with another colleague at uh, Laurier Brentford campus named Dr. Edward Chisa. And we came together as a team. And the reason we came together is because we noticed some statistics um, and also a lot of anecdotal stories and observations on our own. Many of my, most of my colleagues are African scholars themselves. And, and, uh, and families originally from, from African countries. And um, we know that in Canada that immigrant youth actually outperform native born youth. Uh, we're actually, I think, I think we're still the only OECD country, so the, the most industrialized countries where our immigrant youth actually do better. Uh, they do really well in school. And uh, unfortunately, not all of them do. If you start to break that down, there are certain groups of youth who don't perform as well. Uh, including Black youth from continental Africa, uh, the Caribbean as well, but we're specifically focused on, on Africa, and especially boys, um, and especially refugees. Uh, they tend to be more vulnerable. 
Um, they have lower academic standards. They, they, they study in lower streams. Uh, they drop out at higher rates and they enter university in, in lower proportions. So in 2015, uh, we received some SHRC funding to conduct a study of male African youth. So all immigrant youth, immigrants and refugees together, um, all boys, young men uh, in Ontario, in Southern Ontario. Uh, we interviewed, I think 80, uh, almost 80 youth and half of them had gone on to university and college and half of them had not. Um, and we wanted to see what their experiences were like and how they were making those decisions. What made them decide to go on to post-secondary? Um, and the uh, research kind of, um, uh, it, uh, it and, and my lights keep going out. My goodness, the technical problems I'm having. One moment, please. I'm in an office with timed lights. Apparently, I just have to stand up. Um, so in this study, we found a lot of, surprising i mean we found some obvious uh, uh, obvious findings that 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 uh, we knew were coming uh, but we found some surprises as well um, and the big findings were that the the school supports that exist especially in high school um, they're not they're not adequate um, they, they often impede racialized african students ability to fulfill their post-secondary goals uh, by grade nine, uh, we found that guidance counselors in particular did not expect these young men to do well in school, and they were commonly encouraged to take up applied vocational courses rather than the academic stream. A lot of news has come out about this. Dr. Carl James at York University led a study in the Toronto School Board and found that, yes, streaming of black, yeah, black students, but particularly boys, is quite common. Um, Ontario officially ended the, 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 the streaming uh, this year. However, it's still it's still done. It's, it might not be on paper, but it's still done. Um, the young men were not given the opportunity to make their own decisions about education and career paths. It seemed to us that everyone was making the decisions for them. Their parents were, they wanted them to be doctors and lawyers. Uh, the guidance counselors were, the teachers were, but nobody really asked the young men what they wanted to do. This was quite common. Um, we also saw a lot of stereotyping of black students, harsher discipline of black students, and black students being, being discouraged from attending university. We also found that parents could be, um, could enable their children, but they could also disable their children. Um, and, and that's an important finding as well, which, you will, which we will talk about later on. Um, African youth who arrived at refugee, as refugees, probably not surprisingly, were more vulnerable to adversity than their immigrant counterparts, but they were also really determined to overcome that adversity. Um, those who arrived uh, with refugee backgrounds were determined. Um, they were going to do well, they were going to go on to university, and there was no stopping them. Um, and then a significant amount of these youth didn't take a linear path. Um, they, they went to high school, they dropped out of high school, they went back, they completed their high school as an adult. Some, some completed high school in jail. Um, or they started out with vocational subjects, and then they went back and they upgraded or they decided not to go to university and they waited a few years and went back. Um, nothing was linear. They went back and forth. They had a lot of second chances. Um, and, uh, and actually we found that those who didn't go on to university and decided to go directly to the labor market had their own businesses, which was really neat. They all had these businesses going on on the side, whether it was online or an actual in-person business. Um, and the and the last um, the, the the last piece was that they, they talked a lot about we we, we asked about ethnic associations about African ethnic associations and they tended to report that they were not very helpful uh, to their educational and career pursuits. So these were all a bunch of findings. Uh, we we published um, a lot of uh, uh, quite a few articles from this. Our team and 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 the publications keep going. We had quite a bit of data to work with. So then we started taking these findings and asking, okay, what is this? What, what is it that we're seeing? Uh, particularly Oliver. Oliver loves to take an idea and run with it. And then he'll apply for a grant. And we kept applying for grants and getting the funding and, and breaking off pieces of this research. Uh, so in 2019, I, I received a, a grant for a national study uh, that crosses uh, six provinces and six universities focusing specifically on these refugee youth to answer that question. You know, what, what is it about the refugee youth? 
Um, this time we added girls um, because we discovered um, our own mistake, again, fixing our mistakes as we go along, is that you can't really focus on one gender without the other because you need to be able to compare the two. Um, so this is a multi-site study uh, there, again, across six provinces, six universities. Each university is connected with one or two community organizations, um, and we're all working together. So we have about 360 youth involved across Canada. Uh, we're also involving guidance counselors. Uh, we're the first study that we know of where we're actually um, going out and surveying the guidance counselors to find out about their training, to find out um, uh, to find out how they're counseling uh, th these youth. Um, so again, refugee youth from, from various African countries and community organizations. Of course, we were all just beginning this when the pandemic hit and, and we were frozen. Um, so we're only now um, going out and, and actively doing interviews. So we're active in, we have a study site in Newfoundland, uh, Quebec, uh, Ontario, uh, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, and British Columbia. And some of our early findings are, again, um, the, the boys are struggling more. Um, they're, they're certainly, they're, they're, there's a, they're, they're more vulnerable. Uh, many African parents with refugee backgrounds, especially moms, um, don't believe they have the, the capability to help their children with schoolwork. This was huge, um, very important. And you'll see what we did with this finding because it started a whole new project that, that's, that's really exciting and taking up a lot of time at the moment. Um, and African refugee parents are often viewed by the, the Canadian school authorities as lacking the competencies to engage in their children's education. Um, the schools give up on them. There's not a lot of communication or engagement happening between the families and, and the schools. Um, so I'm just going to go back to that one for one second. And uh, yeah, so I mean, there's other findings. Macy, sorry, work. it's actually not going forward. We're not seeing anything moving forward. You're not seeing the slides? No. Oh my no, goodness. it's just staying on outline the whole time. I don't know if you can just um, on your on your slideshow. If you click from beginning, it would show the whole whole page. You're showing now. I hit the end button. You're no. really telling me now. Wow. <laughs> okay. No, I, I, um, I had, but I, but I, I thought it was moving forward, and then, and then I, I have noticed okay, now. Okay. So the end again. button does that work? Is not moving forward still? Moving forward for me. Yeah. No. Are you in presentation mode? Uh, yeah. Hmm. I believe so. Let me go back. Slideshow from beginning. We're going now. No. So, my goodness, we're having a lot of problems. Yeah, unfortunately. So what if, if you, I put you it, just move it down? There we go. Yeah. What if, just I, move it. what if I leave it like this? Is that okay? Yes. Yes. All right. Well, that's not as nice to look at, but don't sorry worry about that. I have no idea. It's it's moving for me. Yeah. Okay. So that was the introduction. Our findings. I talked about dissemination of findings, and this is where we are now. So the post-secondary education transition of African refugee youth across Canada. Our purpose. Um, our preliminary findings. Okay. So. The, one of the big findings coming out of the, the current research is, is the parents, um, and particularly mothers, uh, again. And, and we hear this over and over again, um, that, um, that there, there's just not enough communication be, between the schools and, and, the, and the families. Uh, so this led us to try to fill in this gap by uh, applying for another grant. Um, this, this was a SHRC community uh, partnership grant. Uh, with that, with an organization in Waterloo called Adventure for Change, uh, which has become a very, very important uh, community partner of ours. And uh, Adventure for Change uh, is a, a grassroots community organization that runs uh, a lot of programming for a specific uh, neighborhood, a specific community in, in the northern part of, of the Waterloo region um, called Sunnydale. And, and most of these families have refugee backgrounds from Somalia, Ethiopia, and Eritrea, and Sudan, but largely Somalia. And, uh, and they're all moms. Um, it's the moms who take care of their kids' education. It's the moms who are responsible to help with homework. And uh, it's the moms who come to Adventure for Change for support. 
Uh, so they have homework programs and tutoring and, and athletics and various activities, uh, mentoring for, for the youth and also sewing and uh, uh, a, a lot of uh, programming for the mothers as well. Uh, so we partnered up uh, to come up with uh, a new pilot program um, and it's, it's a, it's a one-year pilot program called Brighter Futures which aims to help African mothers with refugee backgrounds to become more involved and assertive in the decisions that affect their children's education as they transition to high school. Um, and it really is a collaborative, holistic effort led by Adventure for Change with the involvement of our research team, Oliver, myself, and uh, some PhD students and an undergrad student as well. Uh, two schools, uh, the Waterloo Region uh, District School Board is involved and the African moms are, are participating in the project. Um, in fact, we sit down with the moms, we find out what they want, what they need, what they feel they need from the schools. We were just there last week. Um, and then we do a lot of events, a lot of meetings, uh, very informal meetings with school officials uh, to break that ice and, and build their confidence to be able to communicate more, more readily with the schools. And of course, there's a lot of academic literature out there uh, which uh, finds that uh, the more active uh, parents are in their, in their children's education, the, the, the better their children do at school. Um, and high school is, is a really important time for that to happen. And, that, and that's where they're getting lost at that transition from middle school, uh, so grade seven and eight, into grade nine. Um, and grade nine is where a lot of decisions are made. That's where the decisions are made, uh, whether these kids are gonna follow an academic route into university or an applied vocational route in, into a college or, or the trades. Um, so it's really important. So we're trying to create these opportunities for mothers to interact with the teachers and the guidance counselors and the school administrators on an ongoing basis. Um, again, we're not looking for theory. Um, um, we're, we're looking for community practice um, with this, this vulnerable, often overlooked uh, population. We're empowering the women to effectively engage and make decisions about their children's education as they transition to high school. Uh, we're also building the mom's literacy skills and their English um, because it's not only English that they're struggling with. Um, they grew up in refugee camps uh, at Kakuma and Dadaab and in Kenya, and many of them have, in fact, some of them have no education behind them at all. Um, so their literacy is, 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 is they, they struggle with literacy. It's, it's very deep. And of course that hurts their confidence a lot. Uh, so we're, we're, we're trying to strengthen their, their already existing re resiliency and resourcefulness, uh, enabling them to contribute more to society uh, ultimately, um, and helping their children to value education, set goals and aspire to fulfill life after school. So we're working on that now. Uh, we Again, we were frozen up a little bit during the pandemic and we're now running, uh, we're in Waterloo a lot now working on that project. And while the pandemic, as the pandemic was hitting uh, last uh, March, 2020, uh, a funding opportunity came through again through uh, SHRC and uh, for a rapid response uh, study uh, to look at the impact of COVID. Uh, so we quickly applied for funding and got that as well and built on to this Brighter Futures to, to, to work with the moms, uh, to, to see how the moms were assisting with, uh, with, with the online schooling. Uh, all of a sudden, uh, the pandemic hit, um, these mothers were already struggling, uh, their kids were already struggling in school, and then the pandemic hit and, and they were all sent home uh, during these um, lockdowns that, uh, that intermittent, but most of the time they were locked down. More than not, they were at home doing this, this online schooling. Um, and it was hard. Uh, so during the pandemic, we uh, occasionally we were able to meet with the mothers in person once we finally got permission to do that. Uh, wearing masks, we were able to interview them. Uh, we were also able to talk on the phone, uh, usually with one of the children behind uh, interpreting for us. Um, they didn't like Zoom. They didn't like any of the any of the uh, technologies. Um, so we were watching in real time. Um, we were watching in real time as the pandemic unfolded, um, how they were managing the 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 social and the economic stresses and uncertainty associated with the with the crisis. And of course, it was it was hard. Um, we found overstressed moms, depressed teens who slept all day, and lots of really bored, lonely people. Um, living in small, um, overcrowded homes. Uh, some of these parents have 10, 11 children um, of various ages. 
and and we wanted to understand how they were how they were keeping motivated how they were doing with school um, and this was a quick study so we actually do have findings uh, we just sent one of the articles focusing on the moms to uh, to a journal um, and and the findings were of course the digital divide um, the moms uh, just couldn't could, couldn't figure out the technology um, they, they didn't have high enough literacy to be able to read emails uh, to be able to, to figure out how teams and zoom worked um, and uh, and barriers to communication of course um, the schools kept emailing them but they couldn't read the emails they preferred that the schools called and uh, left a voice message because at least they could listen to that a few times and understand it better um, lack of space um, it was okay uh, the uh, the high schools in Waterloo actually sent the kids home with with Chromebooks so all the high school students had computers to work with um, the elementary school kids didn't um, however just because they had a computer didn't mean they had a table and a chair uh, or any space in the house to be able to put the computer and also there were too many people trying to use the same Wi-Fi um, so that was that was problematic as well and my lights keep turning out on me. Okay, I'm just gonna sit in the dark for a bit here. <laughs> um, there was also uh, a lack of time, uh, definitely a gender division of labor. The moms were exhausted. They were doing everything. Um, there were too many kids in the house. Um, when the kids were at school, they would, they would be able to hang out with their neighbors, hang out with their community and help each other, uh, but they were locked down. Uh, financial insecurity is, is an obvious one, and then food insecurity. Um, a, the moms would tell us, um, wow, um, teenage boys eat a lot. Um, they, they, they were used to the school giving breakfast or giving snacks, and suddenly uh, their grocery bills were going up as well. So those were some of the findings, and we've been working with those as well on, on a few publications. And then um, another big gap was not only the moms, uh, but the youth. Uh, we really wanted to help Adventure for Change with um, some more mentoring opportunities uh, for the youth. Um, and, and this time we wanted to, to bring the community in even more. Um, so we applied to Heritage Canada for their community support, multiculturalism and anti-racism initiatives, but we haven't heard back yet. And it's been almost a year. Uh, this is a big grant and it's an important grant because it's much more flexible money and a lot of it can go to the actual community organization. Um, and this, this idea, again, is, it's, it's the same thing. It's, it's to build the kids' confidence. It's to get them engaged. It's, um, it's to open up the university. We have Laurier involved. We have the Dean of Students at Laurier who has signed on to give a, a workshop to, to these youth, uh, to bring them over and show them the campus and show them that you know it's possible to go to university. We have the police, of the, the Waterloo Region uh, Police have signed on, the police chief to work with the youth as well. Again, we have the school board and, and schools. Um, and again, it's the same idea to bring them together, to, to break the ice, to bring them into informal meetings uh, with, with these mentors. Um, and these is, this is specifically um, uh, kid, uh, youth with, uh, with a bl a Black African Muslim youth. Um, almost all of them are, are from Somalia. Uh, again, it's boys and girls, but we tend to, to focus a lot on, on the boys in that project as well. And uh, I'm going to try to turn on my lights again. I'm so sorry. <laughs> I am on campus in a brand new uh, boardroom and the lights are on a timer. So, and it's nighttime and there's nobody here. Okay. Um, so. When we go back to those, you didn't see the slide. I didn't realize you didn't see it, but it was one of the findings that uh, it, from 2015 and 2017 uh, that the, the, the young guys who didn't go on to post-secondary education uh, tended to have a business going on the side and that it wasn't a linear transition uh, into, into the labor market. Uh, so we, we, we found that gap as well. And this is actually a study that Oliver is, is leading. Again, he applied for more funding and got it. It was a really successful funding year during the pandemic for the two of us. And uh, we have another study that we're just beginning uh, in mostly in Toronto, uh, looking at young African entrepreneurs. Um, and again, we want to know what pathway, uh, the educational pathway that lead these young African immigrants uh, to become entrepreneurs. 
And we want to know, did they really want to become entrepreneurs? Um, is it a dream to become an entrepreneur? Or did they not have a choice? Because some kind of barrier, perhaps racism, uh, was stopping them from, from getting uh, into the labor market in a more formal, in a, a more formal way. Um, so we're documenting their lived experiences to better understand how their education skills and aspirations transected systemic inequities to guide their path toward entrepreneurship. Uh, we're working on that one currently. Uh, then we found another, um, another gap when we mentioned before that the, the, the kids aren't making decisions for themselves. Um, everyone's making the decisions for them. Uh, so there's another wonderful community organization uh, in Hamilton uh, called Empowerment Squared. Uh, and Empowerment Squared is run by a young man who graduated from McMaster. He was a refugee himself from Liberia. And uh, they do work in Liberia as well. They just built a big library or they're in the process of building a big library there. Um, so we partnered with uh, Empowerment Squared. And again, Oliver is leading this study. Um, and this one is building a youth council. Uh, so this one, we're not focused on the parents. We're focused on the kids and they're younger. Uh, their age is 12, uh, 12 to 18, but really about 12 to 15. Uh, and and we uh, again, research shows that the, the majority of the, the decisions are just not made by the youth themselves, um, and they're made by other people. And uh, often these youth perceive themselves as lacking the knowledge, skills, and competence to, to articulate and defend their views, as, as with their parents. Um, so we're hoping that a youth council might address this problem. And it was actually Empowerment Squared that came forward to us uh, and asked us to help them develop a youth council. Uh, so the youth council is going to basically um, govern the decisions and the activities of Empowerment Squared. Uh, and Empowerment Squared is very, it's, it's very similar. It does a lot of youth programming, uh, school transitions, a lot of tutoring. Uh, they have a stay at home by yourself course for, for youth. Um, and again, youth with uh, in quite um, uh, vulnerable neighborhoods uh, that they focus on. Again, a lot of backgrounds out of Somalia, but also Syrian youth are involved in this in this study as well. And uh, they, they are uh, just working on putting that youth council together. And our research team, which is Oliver and myself, uh, Christopher Kiriakidis out of York University and Alpha Baby out of McMaster uh, in Hamilton, uh, will be there to, to interview the youth as they go along and measure uh, we'll be measuring how their confidence builds over time uh, as they get involved in this, this youth council and, uh, and learn leadership skills. They'll be presenting to each other, they'll be presenting to their peers uh, and working together throughout the year. Uh, and then the final, uh, the, the, the final uh, result where we mentioned the African associations, we didn't think that the youth didn't think they were very particularly uh, helpful. Uh, the, on behalf of the Shepo Institute, uh, at Laurier, Oliver put in another grant for a uh, for Shirk Connections grant, and we just got funding to do a conference uh, in March. And we really hope that it's in person. We're we're, we're planning on on it being in person uh, here on the Brantford campus, uh, where we're bring, we're bringing uh, African associations from across Canada, Anglophone and Francophone, uh, to to look at how they function, um, how they work with community practitioners, how they work with each other, if they work with each other. Uh, because they really are divided by, by nationality um, and how they work with their youth to prepare them for the future. Um, and asking them basically, you know, how can we help? How can we help work together to, to prepare these, these youth in, in a better way? Um, so this is, uh, this is another exciting, uh, exciting um, event that, that, uh, we're, that are, that's in the works now, uh, getting that all planned out. So, those are the actual projects and the gaps and 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 i'm concluding uh, the presentation now to really emphasize how important these community organizations are we're just the researchers um we're there to watch we're there to measure we're there to to ask questions and and to better understand but it's the community organizations who are doing all of the work um nobody knows these kids better nobody knows these mothers better um, and this all started because of that national project that I mentioned, uh, working with youth with refugee backgrounds, um, me going to a couple of organizations and asking if they could help us recruit kids. Um, and, and, and then that turned into a, a beautiful partnership 
um, that's uh, informal and welcoming. I mean, when I go to an adventure for change in Waterloo, they welcome me as they welcome the youth. I love hanging out there. I love when we have the opportunity to be able to eat pizza together uh, when, when uh, again, in between lockdowns or when we have the permission to do so. Um, they really fill in the gap that's left by public services. Um, they, they, they bridge the families and the schools. Um, the, the, the schools could not know these families without these organizations. And they're also vital to the universities. Uh, Laurier does a lot of community service learning and co-op placements uh, for at both Adventure for Change and Empowerment Squared. Um, they need to be better funded. Um, and, and the Tri-Council funding, the SHRC and all of the money I mentioned, very little of that can go to the community organizations. It goes to the universities. Um, and that's what academic funding is. Um, so we're always looking for ways, whether through Trillium or through other grants, uh, to get these organizations funded uh, because they, 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 they need that. Uh, they have a great space. Um, the, the, the organization in Waterloo has this, a big space called the Hub, and it's expensive. Um, it's expensive to maintain that rep. Um, so this picture just, this is a, a picture, and I, I have permission to share it. Um, Jeremy Horn is the director of, of Adventure for Change. And when I saw this picture, I said, give it to me, um, because it just says it all. Um, they were doing a, a soccer workshop. They were also having a, a, a religious celebration. The kid was dressed up uh, for the celebration. And look at her go. Um, and it just, it says it all. They don't need uniforms. They don't need uh, formalities or structure. They just need that soccer ball and it just the joy. Uh, and that little girl's face, and we have several pictures of her in different poses, says it all. So again, in conclusion, um, I, again, I apologize for the slides not, not working. We're, we're not used to this, this, uh, this system. Um, we're, we're looking for, for that big picture understanding. Um, and, uh, very, and, and while there is research in Canada on, on Black youth, um, there's been a fair amount of research, for example, in Toronto, uh, by again, by mostly by Dr. Carl James at York. Um, none of them focus specifically on the on youth from the continent of Africa. Um, we're, as far as we know, we're, we're some of the first researchers to do that uh, across Canada. And we're looking at that big picture, trying to get that understanding of, of the challenges that these youth face while making those transitions, transition into high school, transition into post-secondary education, transition into the labor market. Uh, and then the role of these community organizations, the role of institutions, uh, be it the university or engaged citizens in, in making those transitions happen. Uh, our work brings a lot of partners together um, and we're really just trying to understand how each piece fits together. Uh, if theory comes out of that, great. I'm sure the academic journals would, would love to have a nice big theoretical finding, but that's not our intent. Uh, so that's our presentation. And I just wanted to go through, uh, we're not alone here. Um, these projects uh, involve a lot of faculty from, this is our Cross Canada team uh, from uh, the various universities, uh, our community, um, community organizations, Adventure for Change, um, our, we have other uh, colleagues uh, at Laurier working on our young entrepreneurs. Uh, we have York and McMaster involved. And of course, we have incredible PhD students and one undergrad student who uh, we, 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 we love to see her graduate, Mila, uh, but we'll also cry because she, we're, we're so dependent on her work. She is wonderful. So thank you. I'm going to stop sharing. There we go. <laughs> All the technical difficulties. I'm coming back. Oh my goodness. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. I kept trying to see if it, it was working and, and uh, Oliver, I, I, I wish we could hear your, your, your voice <laughs> come through. Uh, we do have a couple of questions. That was an uh, amazing presentation. Thank you so much for sharing all the work you're doing. Um, and we have a couple of questions from, uh, from people who are here this evening. So the first one is, uh, did your work explore the impact of mentoring for the high school students? For example, did the students mention having someone to help them navigate high school would, uh, would have been helpful? Yes, yeah, mentoring mentoring is, is, is extremely important um, and, and, it, and it's woven through everything, uh, through, through all of the work, which is why we, we put in um, 
a proposal for Heritage Canada. Um, that, that grant uh, we still don't have the results for is really about mentoring. Mentoring from the university, uh, from the school board, from, from different people in the community. Um, the work on the entrepreneurs, I'm sure, has a very strong mentoring component as well. We suspect it does. We're just not there yet uh, to find out, but, but definitely. Um, and that's what these organizations do as well. They, they mentor these youth for sure. Yes, the role models are, are crucial. Indeed. Um, so are there any conversations with educators around communicating with families and addressing bias when guiding these students? Uh, Black Canadian students already have guidance counselors and teachers streaming us towards trades and, and um, call, I, I think it meant to say college and away from university. So being a refugee adds another layer of intersectionality that negatively impacts their journey through education and reduces their chances to go straight to university versus your findings of starting and stopping and returning. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and and it, it's a constant conversation, but we're only a small team. Um, and uh, and it's a finding, we, we keep finding it. I interviewed a young lady um, just a few weeks ago. Uh, she's in grade 12 and she was actually, I trained her uh, on the COVID-19. We actually trained her to uh, act as a research assistant and do some interviews and focus groups. And she was incredible, absolutely incredible, this young woman. And I interviewed her and she couldn't be more articulate. And I was so surprised in the middle of the interview when she told me she was streamed into vocational. Um, she was an applied. She's in grade 12. She can't go on to university. Um, she's going to try for the college system. Um, and that was disappointing to hear. And, and it happens a lot, a lot more than, than people think. We hear it all the time that these kids are told they're not university material. Refugees, especially. Um, it does add another layer. Um, absolutely. Uh, because they, they have, I mean, they have race working against them. They have religion working against them because most of them are from Somalia and they're Muslim. Um, they have poverty working against them. Uh, the fact that their, their parents can't be engaged or, or we're, we're working on helping them be engaged um, and, uh, and, and trauma, uh, depending on when they came or, or intergenerational trauma. If they came as babies, they're picking up the trauma from their parents. Uh, if they came as teens, then they're, they're dealing it with themselves. It's, it's so many. I mean, the intersectionality is, is, is unbelievable. Um, and yes, the streaming's happening. And Ontario has officially ended it, but, but uh, it's only happening now that it's ending. We'll see what happens. Uh, but yes, we're, we're constantly having conversations. Just last week, we were with the Waterloo Region uh, District School Board, and, and, and they, they are so excited about this. Um, they, they, don't want, they, they want these kids to succeed. Um, but that's only one school board, and our study goes right across Canada. So we have so much work to do with schools and with guidance counselors. And I would love to see more uh, guidance counselors with African backgrounds or black guidance counselors be hired. I don't, I mean, we haven't really walked around the schools, but we're guessing they're not. Um, and, and teaching staff in general, I mean, it's, it's not diverse. Uh, most teachers, uh, most teachers in Ontario uh, are white women from rural Ontario. Mm -hmm. um, without a lot of training in diversity. Um, so it's, it's tough. It's tough for sure, but we're working on it. Yeah. That's great. Um, if anybody else has any questions, we've got the little ask question button there. Um, your, your research sounds fascinating to me and um, you can see all the links that are required to, to really come together so that, um, you know, the, 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 the youth can feel empowered to, you know, go, go this, go on this path. I feel like I'm in a, in a bad movie can't take. Um, This has been very entertaining for me. That, that's <laughs> very entertaining. Because that um, one's happened to me. I love me. the high tech lights, so just turn off on me. <laughs> that one's happened to me in a presentation and I kept having to wave my arms, arms around. Yeah, I have to go near the light switch and, and, and wave to it. Oh, um, yeah, it's, 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 um, and I mean, you know, for those of us who are who are uh, in in academia and we publish, um, quantitative quantitative research obviously is so important. And Oliver and I, especially Oliver, he's an economist. We rely on stats. Uh, we need those stats. We need to justify our research with the statistics. It's so important. Um, but it's much faster. Um, you, you can publish statistics and use secondary data very fast, whereas um, this research, this community-engaged research is extremely time-consuming. Uh, at a pandemic, 
to it. And, uh, and anyone that's trying to work in the community, that's two years of, of, of our research gone. Um, but it's still important. And, and the relationship building is a lot of fun. Um, it's, it's, um, I, 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 once we were given permission to finally get out and meet people in, in person, it was such a joy to just go and hang out at these organizations and be with the kids and uh, just, just spend time with them and get to know them. Uh, we, don't, we don't like to interview youth without knowing them. We have to build that trust with them first. So we spend a lot of time just relationship building and building the trust with the school board um, because otherwise they wouldn't, um, we need them. They, they need to be involved in this research. They need to trust us. Uh, so there's a lot of meetings and, and a lot of back and forth for sure. Um, so someone is asking where they may be able to find more of your research. Um, th it's all listed on the slides, which you didn't see. Uh, there, there, there's all the, all the publications are listed there. Um, my faculty no. profile, uh, Shapo Institute web, uh, our website has all of the publications listed as well. Is that S H E P O? Shapo. Oh, T S T T S H E P O. Yeah. And also, um, the newsletter we send out, we can, we can add some links as well to that. Sure afterwards oh it looks like one another question has popped popped up here um do networks or the lack of networks impact the experiences of youth particularly those who are transitioning to the labor market sorry i was reading the chat at the same time can you repeat no that? <laughs> do networks or the lack of networks impact the experiences of youth particularly those who are transitioning to the labor market yeah, of course of course, as any any immigrant youth, um, again, with all of these challenges working uh, with uh, against them, um, not having those networks, which is where mentoring comes in as well, because it's not only a role model, but it's also connecting these youth with other people. Um, and we all know that that uh, you're, you're the uh, human capital are your skills and financial capital is, is your your money and your bank account and social capital is who you know. And Canada is very much a who you know place. Um, and of course, those networks are so, so important, especially in the entrepreneurship study. Uh, yeah, we want to know who connected them and, and where they got there, what, what those pathways look like and tracing those networks, for mm -hmm. sure. Definitely. I was able to share um, your research page in the in the chat as Perfect. well. Well, thank you so much, uh, Stacy and Oliver. This has been an uh, it's been an adventure. <laughs> adventure. Uh, we're, we're, we've we've mastered the art of Zoom because we've been teaching on it for um, almost two years now. But when it's yeah. a new system, it's wow. This is this is really really complicated. And lights turning off and slides not going forward when they were for me, but not for you. Oh, I dear. look forward to uh, doing this in person again one day. It's, in person it's, would be so much fun for sure. Yeah, we'll have to do it again uh, once we're, we're able to do so. So um, on behalf of Wilfrid Laurier University and Milton Public Library, thank you again, Stacey and Oliver, for your knowledge, expertise, and incredible resources with us this evening. Um, thank you to all the attendees tonight. And uh, just a reminder again, a copy of tonight's lecture will be shared on the Milton Public Library website in the next few days, as well as on YouTube. And uh, we'll be sharing. <laughs> well, yes. All of our technical difficulties on YouTube. Wow. <laughs> Unedited version. <laughs> okay, edited version would be terrific. <laughs> <laughs> and our next lecture will be January 12th, which will be about ethics in design. Thank you, everyone and have a wonderful rest of the year and all the best in 2022. Thank you again. Thank you. Bye-bye.